How's it look out there? It's really starting to accumulate. And the wind is picking up too. Well, they just said on TV that the wind's whipping up to almost 25 miles per hour out of the northwest. Did they say how cold it's going to get? Last report, 10 above zero with a wind chill 29 below. I'm sure I'm going to get a call from the shop and keep snowing like this. Are you ready? With the second shift ready to begin soon, all the knowledge you've gained both in your training sessions and during your first ride, is going to be tested. Because today is the real thing. Out on that highway, it is going to be just you, with all you have learned, and that truck with all its equipment, fighting Mother Nature. Are you ready for the challenge? In this video, you'll learn the basic snow plowing techniques that veteran Iowa DOT snowplow operators have developed and used over the years. Techniques for clearing two-lane roads and multiple-lane highways will be covered, as well as the operation of reversible plows, V-plows, wings, and ice blades. You're off to a good start. Always remember to use your seatbelt. Place your lunchbox and thermos somewhere in the cab where they are secure and will not slide around. If you have difficulty finding a safe spot in your truck for these items, you might consider using the passenger side seat belt or a bungee cord to secure them. Before you head out, also make sure you are familiar with all the controls. There are lots of them. Plow, wing, spreader and ice blade, as well as the vehicle controls. Know the location of all controls so you can operate them without taking your eyes off the road. Also be familiar with the operation of your two-way radio and make sure it is working. On your first time out alone, you will probably be assigned to plow two-lane two-way roads. To begin, stay in your own lane. Position the left side of the plow near the center of the road and angle your plow to the right to push the snow off the right-hand side of the road. Always try to uncover the center line on your first pass. Normally, you will also use your light-duty wing as a plow extension to increase your plowing width. If the wind is blowing hard, or if it is especially still and the snow is falling straight down, you may have difficulty from time to time seeing the center line. When you can't see the center line, you may have to revert to using the edge of the road as your guide. Veteran snowplow operators often watch the shoulder for signs of rock or grass if there is not a hard surfaced shoulder. You can also look for delineators, guardrails, road signs, mailboxes, and other objects that can help give you some idea where the center line is. You can usually feel when the front wheel goes off the road onto the shoulder. If this happens, compensate by carefully steering back towards the center line. When you get to the end of your run, find a safe place to turn around. Once you have made your turn and are ready to head back, Position the plow to catch the snow that was left near the center of the road. If you're lucky, you'll be able to see the center line. But many times, the center line is already covered up by the time you head back. Continue making passes until both of the driving lanes are open and have been returned to near normal winter driving conditions, or you are reassigned to a different route. Everything you will learn about plowing a two-lane highway applies to plowing a multiple-lane freeway or interstate, with the exception of where you make your first pass. As with any road, the first concern on a multiple-lane divided highway is to provide a pathway for vehicles to get through. Where you plow that first lane depends on whether there is a median wide enough to hold the snow. If there is a wide median, then the logical thing to do is to make your first pass in the right-hand lane with your plow angled to the right. Move the snow on that first pass to the right-hand shoulder. With your second pass, angle your plow to the left and move the snow to the left, towards the median. If two trucks can work together, of course, 
you can get a lot more done with one plow moving the snow to the right and the second moving the snow to the left. Here, the lead truck is in the right lane with a plow angled to the right pushing snow toward the shoulder. The second truck follows with a plow angled to the left. This truck has to be lined up so that it catches the snow left by the first truck. If there isn't a wide median, you don't have a choice. You'll have to push all of the snow to the right. Here the lead truck can't push snow to the left. There is no place for it to go. So it pushes snow to the right. The second truck lines up so that it catches the snow that was left by the first truck and continues pushing the snow to the right. When you are working alone and you are in a situation where you can't move snow to the left, then you'll have to make your first pass in the left lane and then follow up by catching the snow that was left by your first pass and continue pushing snow to the right. Now that you have learned the general techniques of clearing two-lane and multiple-lane highways, let's talk about some specific things you need to keep in mind when you are plowing snow. About 25 miles per hour has proven to be the most efficient plowing speed. When speed exceeds 25, the plow tends to skip over the snow and it will require an extra trip to clear the snow that was left. As an operator, you need to know that excessive speed can damage snowplow equipment very easily. Be especially aware of your speed when plowing in town. If you are moving too fast, snow will roll off the plow with high force and travel quite a distance, which can cause damage to property. Also, watch for pedestrians who may be in the line of flying snow. Others rely on you to make their trip safer, so always think prevention and drive defensively at all times. Don't assume others see or hear you approach. Be on constant watch so that you can compensate for others' mistakes. Scan well ahead for oncoming traffic and potential hazards. In snowy conditions with decent visibility, that's about a quarter of a mile or 12 to 15 seconds ahead. Also, scan the rear view mirror every three to five seconds to check for drivers ready to pass you. If a long line of vehicles forms behind you, use your judgment about moving over to allow traffic to pass by. If you make a decision to pull over, always signal your intentions and pick your spot carefully. Shoulders and driveways can be icy and slick or soft and muddy at various times during the winter months, so be cautious. Also, always be on the alert for emergency vehicles. It is not always possible to pull your plow entirely off the road. But when an emergency vehicle needs to pass, slow down and pull over to the right as far as possible. If you should come upon an accident and you believe you need to render aid or assistance to the injured, be sure you use universal precautions in treating victims so as not to endanger your own health. When roads are snow and ice covered, it of course takes longer to stop. Try to anticipate when you need to slow down or stop and leave yourself plenty of room. Turning takes more room too. When you add a plow to the front of the truck, the truck becomes longer and wider. You won't be able to make a lot of turns that you could make without the plow attached. So think ahead. Be selective in finding a spot to turn around. Make sure there is plenty of space to turn and that you have a clear view in all directions. Even driving on straight sections of road is like nothing you have ever experienced. The snow really has an effect on how the truck handles. As you push the snow, it is pushing your truck in the opposite direction you are pushing the snow. If you are plowing to the right, the snow will push the truck to the left. When there is a lot of snow on the road, you'll have to oversteer to counteract that force. Visibility is generally an issue when you are plowing snow. If the wind isn't blowing the snow, your plow or other vehicles are kicking it up. Keep your windows as clean as possible so you can see in all directions. If your truck is equipped with heated mirrors, make sure they are turned on. 
Always keep your windshield wipers clean. And always have your lights on so others can see you. There will be times when you must slow down because of visibility problems or even have to pull off the road in the case of a complete whiteout. Operating a snow plow, especially in severe weather conditions, can be highly stressful, if at all possible. Prepare yourself and get plenty of sleep before you arrive for your shift. Once you are on the job, drink liquids and eat enough food to stay alert and keep your energy level up. Also, whenever you feel the need, stop your truck, get out for some fresh air and stretch. Wear comfortable clothing appropriate for the conditions so that you stay warm and dry even when you have to be outside the truck cab. Your safety and the safety of other drivers on the road is of utmost importance at all times. There may be times when the conditions are so severe that you can't keep your route clear. If this should happen, remain calm and know that sometimes conditions are beyond your control. If at any time you have an important question or a serious problem, use your radio to call your supervisor or another experienced operator. Whenever you stop your plow and get out, it is always a good idea to clean your windshield wipers and wipe off your lights and reflectors. They can get covered very quickly, especially in wet snow. At the same time, make a quick check of your equipment. Are all plow and wing pins in place? Are the lift cables still in good shape? Is there still plenty of blade left? Now that you have learned the general plowing techniques and some of the specifics, let's talk about plowing some of those special areas you will encounter. With the main roadway clear, it's time to start cleaning intersections. Here are a couple of ways it can be done. One is to straighten your plow as you enter the intersection. Go on across, moving slightly to the right as you go through the intersection to catch as much snow as possible. Another method is to go through the intersection from every direction, always moving the snow to the right. This method may also require a couple of final passes with the plow straight to clean up any snow that is left in the center of the intersection. If you are plowing an open or low side rail bridge, one that is open or low enough to allow the snow to go through or over. And if there is not another roadway or railroad below, then you will plow it much the same as a road, moving the snow to the right, over or through the bridge barrier. However, if there is a railroad or a road below, or if the bridge has high closed barriers on each side, then you are going to have to plow it differently than a road. You have to go slower to avoid throwing the snow over the bridge and onto any traffic or tracks below. And instead of moving the snow to the right, set the plow straight or nearly straight and move the snow to the end of the bridge. That way, you don't end up with snow piled along the barrier. That's important, because if the snow builds up along the barrier, it can form a ramp and a vehicle could go up over the barrier and off the bridge. So. For bridges with high closed barriers, plow straight and slow. On super elevated bridges, always move as much snow as possible to the low side of the bridge. That prevents snow on the high side from melting and then refreezing into ice as it flows across the bridge to the low side. Whenever you go on and off a bridge, you must make certain that the angle of your blade is not parallel with the expansion joint. If it is, the blade can fall into the expansion joint and cause considerable damage. Also, be especially careful when plowing truss or pony truss bridges. Hitting a truss with a plow can also cause damage. As you already know or will quickly become aware of, bridge decks tend to ice up before the roadway, so use caution whenever plowing a bridge. When approaching railroad tracks, raise your plow high enough to clear the tracks, then lower it when you're completely across. Otherwise, you could catch the plow in the tracks and damage the moldboard, the blade, or the tracks. Also, 
Turn off the spreader when crossing tracks. There is a very good reason for this. A buildup of snow, ice, salt, or abrasive on the tracks could actually derail a train. So at all railroad crossings, raise your plow and turn off your spreader. Cleaning ramps is much the same as plowing any other type of road. There are a couple of points to keep in mind, though. First, whenever possible, move the snow from the high side of the ramp to the low side, the same as on super-elevated bridges. You don't want a buildup of snow on the high side of the ramp because when it melts, it will run across the road and possibly refreeze if the temperature drops. And second, be sure your plow is angled in the proper direction when coming off a ramp before entering the roadway. There are cases where you'll be pushing snow one way and then, after leaving the ramp, have to push snow the other way. The area between the road and the ramp is called a gore. With gores, the whole idea is to carry the snow past the gore, depositing it beyond the shoulder. To do that, keep the plow straight as you enter the gore, then angle the plow to the right after you pass it. Never push the snow straight into the gore. That would be like building a concrete wall near the roadway. Some gores have crash cushions. These come in a lot of different shapes and sizes, but the procedure is always the same. Keep snow away from them. That is because a buildup of snow here could form either a wall or a ramp, and both are deadly. When cleaning some gores or point areas, it may be necessary to back up and make several passes. And that means you may have to team up with one operator controlling traffic, while the other handles the cleanup job. Curves, raised islands, guardrails, and many other obstacles can present real problems when the snow is deep. Many of these obstacles can be totally hidden, and the only way to avoid hitting them is to know where they are, exactly where they are. You need to memorize the location of these obstacles along your route so you don't hit them when you are plowing. Now, that may sound so obvious that it doesn't even need to be mentioned, but stop and think for a second. Is there a guardrail within two miles of your home? Do you know exactly where it starts and stops? Most people don't. If it is at all possible, drive your route before it snows so you can learn as much as you can about potential problems. Guardrails, curbs, and islands are fairly obvious problems to watch for, but there are a number of other obstacles that you've probably never even noticed. For example, utility companies use steel plates to cover temporary excavations, new sewer lines, water lines, and so on. You can imagine what would happen if you pushed the plate away from the excavation, an open hole. Manholes can present a problem in the same way as steel plates. Usually they are flush with the pavement's surface, which is no problem. But some stand above the surface, and they can snag your plow. Other obstacles that you need to be on the watch for include mailboxes, fire hydrants, delineators, light poles, guide wires, and signs. In a bad storm, any of these can be hard to see and easy to hit. Stalled or stuck vehicles can't be checked on ahead of a snowfall, but can appear quickly, so be on a constant watch for them too. Now that you have the roadway, intersections and bridges clear and traffic is moving, it's time to begin winging the snow from the shoulders. Cleaning the shoulders is to make room for disabled vehicles and to make room for you to put snow from the next storm. The same winging techniques apply whether you are clearing the shoulders on two-lane or multiple-lane highways. When winging, there will be times when a second person will be required to ride in your truck. Your supervisor will point out to you when an additional operator is required. Winging is best accomplished by the use of a heavy-duty truck or maintainer equipped with a heavy-duty wing. Many shops use medium-duty trucks equipped with a light-duty wing for winging snow from shoulders. These also do an excellent job if the snow is not too heavy. 
Winging is an operation that can be very damaging to equipment and caution must be taken at all times. The recommended speed for winging is from 5 to 15 miles per hour. As with plowing, you must be on a constant watch for obstructions. An obstacle as simple as a frozen gopher mound, if not leveled out, can cause considerable damage, even tear the wing off your truck. The better you know your run, where the guardrails, curbs and islands, mailboxes, etc. are located, the better your chance for not damaging your equipment when winging. Always remember, the push arms of the wing must be level with the moldboard at all times. And that means that you never downwing like this. Always operate with the wing in a level position. That means you are going to be leaving some snow on the outside edge of the shoulder. In addition to being hard on equipment, downwinging creates a larger bank of snow along the roadway that will catch an even greater amount of snow when the next storm comes along. If you are plowing gravel shoulders, you most likely will have a skid blade or shoe on the wing to reduce the chances of scraping off the gravel. If for some reason you don't have a skid, make sure you raise the wing a few inches to keep it from scraping the shoulder. When snow drifts are extremely deep, it may be necessary to start your winging operations by cutting the top off the drift. And then, continue on down with each pass that you make. This is called benching because as you move the snow back off the shoulder to create a storage area for the next snow, you are creating the form of a bench with each pass. Be extremely careful when benching or winging back large drifts. The higher the wing is raised, the greater potential for damage because of the tremendous leverage created between the end of the wing and the truck mounting. Always ease slowly into a pile of snow or drift. Never hit it with a great deal of speed. Most wings have safety trips to keep the wing from getting damaged when it comes in contact with a solid object. If the wing should trip, it can be easily reset by raising the heel cable. However, the safety trip will not help if you forget to raise your wing for a bridge. Although this is a simulated situation, it has happened, but don't let it happen to you. An important safety tip Never operate with a wing extended into another travel lane, such as a passing or turning lane. Drivers have been known to attempt to pass a plow with a wing extended into the passing lane. You can imagine the result. To clear a passing lane, just make another pass with your plow. And finally, always make sure you have plenty of ballast when you are winging. When roads are heavily snowpacked or ice covered, you may be called on to operate an ice blade. Here are techniques you should know. When ice blading, it is important that equal pressure be applied to both ends of the blade. Some blades have only one control, so applying equal pressure is not a problem. Other ice blades have two controls, one to raise and lower each end of the blade. When operating a two-lever blade, it can be difficult to tell when you have equal pressure on both ends of the blade. Veteran operators say that they can best tell by the way the truck engine is pulling or how they are sitting in the seat. The ice blade can be angled both left or right, depending on which direction you want to move the ice and snow. After setting the angle, make certain you put the locks in place. Setting the blade tilt or curl is critical when you are ice blading because you always want the sharpest edge of the blade in contact with the highway. If the front edge is the sharpest, then you want the blade to be tilted back. Likewise, if the back edge of the blade is the sharpest, you will get the greatest cutting action if the blade is curled forward. As an operator, you must frequently change the tilt or curl of the blade as the metal wears away. However, Changes in blade angle require only a slight movement of the ice blade. Ice blading should only be done on hard surface roads. Never ice blade on a seal coated surface. It can cause a great deal of damage to the road. As with plowing and winging, you must constantly be on the watch for obstructions that can do damage to the ice blade. Make certain you raise the blade when going over railroad tracks. 
be especially aware of manholes and expansion joints that run at the same angle as your blade. Hitting a raised manhole with your ice blade is an experience you will not quickly forget. Some ice blades have trips to help reduce the jolt and damage caused by hitting a solid object. Others do not have trips. The best advice, drive with caution whenever you are ice blading. The recommended speed is 3 to 10 miles per hour. In addition to using the ice blade to break up and clear off ice and hard packed snow, it can also be used during the plowing operation to help clear snow off the roadway. When used for snow clearing, the ice blade should be angled the same direction as your plow and dragged on the road surface. That means the blade should just touch the road with little or no downward pressure. There will probably be few times, if any, that you will use a V-plow, but when it's needed, there is no other plow that can replace the V-plow. The V-plow is generally called in when the drifts are just too big for straight blade plows to handle. And in most cases, that means that snow is totally blocking traffic. When you come upon a drift, set the V-plow down on its shoes and then evaluate what will be the best way to open the road. The best plan is to try to split the drift so that you end up moving most of the snow to the side of the road where the drift is the shallowest. For example, Let's say you are traveling west and come upon a large drift that is formed on the south shoulder and extends across the road to the other side. With this drift, you would probably want to make your first pass with a V-plow at the south edge of the road, planning to move most of the snow to the north side of the road away from the deep part of the drift. Make your first pass through the drift with your wing up. It isn't a good idea to use the wing during the initial breakthrough. If the drift is not too deep, the wing and V-plow can be used to move the remaining snow from the roadway. Many times, as with the example you just saw, you will be able to plow all the way through a drift without backing up. But large drifts are an exception. Instead of attempting to make it all the way through in one pass, make a series of thrusts into the drift, attacking one side and then the other. When going into a heavy drift, high speed is not recommended move into the drift slowly. If you hit the drift with too much speed, snow may roll up and over the V 